Epilogue Two weeks after David Ramsley was caught during a high-speed chase by FBI officials, said the news anchor, the billionaire was transferred to a medical facility for problems with his heart. Officials say that David may have suffered a heart attack and have released no word on his health. Family and friends of the business tycoon have been silent about his capture and his hospitalization, leading to unanswered questions. Max scowled as he shut off the television. He tugged on his tie, loosening it a little. Paget, are you almost ready? Lunch and supper are in the fridge. Just warm them up. Their snacks are clearly labeled. Don't mix them up because Morgan won't eat the peaches. They each get a story before bed. Paget reminded the babysitter. Don't let Ryder try to talk you into staying up, or an extra story, and Morgan isn't allowed to play any video games. He's still grounded for that stunt he pulled. She grabbed her purse and came forward to straighten Max's tie. We are still on time. No one else said that they would be here with the car service in five minutes. Max straightened Paget's necklace, putting the clasp back behind her neck. Have I told you how much I love you today? Paget smiled. You did. However, two boys are enough. Stop trying to butter me up for a third. What? asked Max innocently. With Noah's kids, we have almost got a baseball team if you and I just have two more. Not happening. Paget gave him a fond kiss. Let's go meet them downstairs. Can't blame a guy for trying. Max smiled, grabbing an umbrella before opening the door for Paget. Christian Gaines was arrested today on charges of money laundering. A business newsperson spoke over the television. Gaines was head of the Ramsley Pharmaceuticals between the tenures of Michael Ramsley and Noah Ramsley. It's believed that Gaines had full knowledge of David Ramsley's activities within the company and thus is being charged as an accessory to the crime. Michael shut off the television screen. He tied the black strip of silk around his neck in a perfect knot before grabbing his jacket. Anne came to stand beside him, sliding an earring through her ear. I'm so thankful. Michael looked at her in surprise. Not about Mr. Gaines. Anne hastened to explain as she wrapped her arms around her husband. I liked him, and I think that it's too bad that he's caught up in all of this. But I'm grateful that you're no longer being investigated. I'm so happy to have you home where you belong. Michael held her, thankful as well. He kissed her forehead and hugged her tightly. Come on, Anne had a teary smile. We don't want to be late. He took her hand as they left the room. Gaines was arrested. Noah informed Al as he slid the phone from his ear, putting it away. I guess the FBI believes that he knew what Dad was up to all along. Al laid a sympathetic hand on her husband's arm as they waited in the limo for Max and Paget to arrive. The couples had decided to carpool together to the funeral, to make it easier. Elle leaned against Noah. I can't help but think that it could have been you. What do you mean? Noah frowned as he looked at his wife. He put a hand over hers. David decided to target Michael, framing him because he was mad that Michael had forced him to retire, Elle explained. It could have easily been you. You defied your father to marry me. I'm still here, Noah assured her. Dad is in prison. He can't hurt any of us any more. I worry, she told him quietly. David is now cornered. He might be at his most dangerous. It will be okay. He wrapped an arm around her. Let's just get through the day. The driver opened the door as Max and Paget approached the car. Drew frowned a hand on Bethany's back as they waited in the parking lot. The clouds threatened to rain, but were holding off for the moment. Molson and Holly pulled up on the motorcycle. Holly pulled off the helmet, smoothing down her hair and skirt, as Molson stowed the helmets away. Are we early? Molson asked, looking around the parking lot. I suppose we are, Drew responded, looking at his watch. Kind of annoying, since we're the odd ones out. They asked us to come, Bethany reminded him. The Ramsleys want to acknowledge us as part of the family. We aren't, grimaced Drew. Not really. They're treating us like we are. 
Molson pointed out. I'm headed to the little girl's room to check on my hair, announced Holly. Beth, care to come? Absolutely, replied Bethany, giving Drew a loving pat on the arm before joining her friend. The guys watched the pair go into the building, electing to stay outside for a while longer. Take your hands out of your pockets, Drew mildly admonished. You do that when you're uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable because I got this tie on, complained Molson, folding his arms across his chest. It's near to strangling me. How are you doing with yours? It's a clip-on, admitted Drew. Cheater, groused Molson, giving in to impulse and pulling at his neck. Leave it alone. Otherwise the ladies will complain, Drew told him. Oh, I don't know, Molson had a grin. I don't mind when Holly adjusts my tie and collar. Drew rolled his eyes. He paused as he spotted FBI agent Kepler standing a little ways away under some trees. Wait here. Molson spotted who Drew was looking at. Not likely. The pair approached Kepler. Tell me you're not here to try to arrest anyone, growled Drew. It's a funeral for pity's sake. Just observing, Kepler assured him, his icy blue eyes fastening on them. I've noticed how tight you and the Ramsley family are getting. I wouldn't say that, Drew replied dampeningly. It would be nice if none of them were to notice you. Let them grieve in private. Nothing is private. Kepler shook his head. I'm amazed the press hasn't showed up yet. Everyone did their best to keep this under cover, responded Drew. It'll all come out sooner rather than later, but for now they would like to keep it quiet. I won't tip the press. Kepler watched a car pull in. Leave them alone. Molson stepped into Kepler's line of vision. Wasn't wrongfully imprisoning Michael enough? Crimes have been committed. Kepler's tone was deceptively mild. It's my job to make sure justice is done. Don't worry, I'll fade into the background and no one will notice. Jake pulled into the parking lot, shutting off the vehicle. Sterling reached out to take his hand. I'm very sorry, Jake spoke gravely. Today was supposed to be a happier day for us. It's not your fault. She took off her seatbelt, sliding across the seat to lean against him as he put his arm around her. No one could have known that he was going to die. We can wait a little longer to get married. Everett said he'll cover any of the cost of lost deposits until your funds are unfrozen and you can pay him back. He had a heavy sigh. I can't believe he's gone. It's going to be okay, Sterling gently assured him. They sat there for a minute, ignoring the outside world. We should go in, Jake reluctantly said. Dylan helped Kelly out of the car. Are you sure you're up for this? There's going to be a lot of standing around. Then I will just have fat ankles at the end of the day. It's okay. She reached up to give him a quick kiss. I will be fine. As the only pregnant lady, I'm sure someone will find me a chair if I really do end up needing one. If you wanted to stay home with the boys, I would not have been upset, suggested Dylan. He grabbed her purse from inside the car and handed it to her before shutting the passenger door. Dylan, look at me, Kelly insisted. She waited until she had his full attention, smoothing out the lapels of his jacket. I love you. I'm here because I want to be. I'm here to support you and your family today. Now stop worrying about me. Worrying is what I do. Dylan pulled her into his arms, hugging her. Reassuring you is what I do. Kelly leaned against him. It's going to be a tough day, but we can get it through it together. Thank you for coming with me. Dylan kissed the top of her head. There's no place I would rather be than with you, she responded honestly. Shall we go inside? Dylan nodded, drawing her arm through his as they headed toward the building. Someone has a motorcycle. Everett eyed the machine. Should we get a motorcycle? Only if I get to drive, Bree said impishly. 
Everett reflected that that might be a bad idea, considering the way she drove a car. Maybe not. Spoil sport. Bree rolled her eyes. She didn't wait for him to get the door for her, hopping out of the SUV and meeting him on their way to the building. She slipped her arm into his. An elderly gentleman solemnly approached them. Mr. Ramsley, pallbearers are meeting in the room right here. Other family members are meeting in this room for the procession. Thank you. Everett took a program that the man offered, handing it to Bree. It started to hit him that this was real. Today, they would be burying one of their own. He swallowed against the emotion that threatened to overcome him. Hey, Bree pulled him to the side. We're all here with you. You're going to get through this. Everett cleared his throat. I don't know why, but it didn't seem real until now. Probably because we've been so busy? Bree allowed him to draw her close. Everett spotted Michael giving Anne a brief hug before the couple separated. Anne going to the room set aside for family, and Michael going into the pallbearer's room. I should go. Bree gave him a quick kiss on the cheek before stepping back, letting him go to the pallbearer's room. Come on. Sterling hooked her arm through Bree's. Let's go meet the rest of the family. Bree nodded, letting herself be led into the family room. Gabe heaved an internal sigh as he recognized Brittany Crawford. She was waiting by the doors of the building, watching him approach, no doubt to offer condolences to the Ramsley family. He wished she would not. Britt and he had never gotten along. She was abrupt, rude, and had a habit of picking on him. She was a know-it-all. Somehow he had been paired with her a lot at school for projects, plays, and on student council. She had always been around. When Grabe had graduated and gone on to work in the family company that managed a chain of hospitals, he had been more than happy to leave her behind. Here she was again. It was only natural to see her. They hung around in the same social circles. However, Gabe was a master of getting out of doing the social whirl. It wasn't something he enjoyed. Brittany? He kept his voice neutral. It had been a few years since they had last met. Perhaps she had grown up. Or maybe his memories of her were a little flawed by his personal dislike of her. Gabriel, she returned, eyeing him critically. You have gained weight. Good to see you, too, he said wryly, annoyed. She was the exact same. You should watch that, she advised him, especially after your uncle had a heart attack and now this death. If you're not careful... You'll become like your cousin Ben. Ben is fine, Gabe defended. Okay, Ben could stand to lose some weight. The guy was rather hefty. Gabe thought of himself as a little husky. He was only carrying around an extra 25 to 30 pounds since his college days. Not something to be worried about. If you got a wife, she could look after your diet and make sure you stay healthy, Brittany pointed out. She followed him into the funeral chapel, oblivious to the fact that her company was unwanted. I'm fine. Gabe wasn't about to go all veggie tray. Maybe he could step it up at the gym a little. Angrily, he shoved the thought away. He was always letting Britt do this, making him feel insecure. Her opinion should not matter. It didn't matter. He almost missed her next words. You could marry me and I will look after you, she offered, entirely serious. Gabe's jaw dropped. Find out more about Gabe and Britt in convincing him. Brittany Crawford and Gabriel Ramsley have a lot in common. They have gone to the same schools. They reside in the same social class. Both their fathers are involved with David Ramsley's schemes and are facing charges and time in prison. However, Gabe just doesn't see it. He thinks Brit's a know-it-all, rude, and annoying girl. He has been trying to ditch her for years. Now she has come forward with an outrageous proposal of marriage to him. Brittany has always had a crush on Gabe. She followed him all around school, and yet he didn't get the hint. 
For some reason, as outspoken as she is, Brittany was never able to tell him how she feels. Now, years later, she has a chance and is going to let Gabe know that she is the right one for him. Sign up for Josephine's weekly newsletter and get a free book, Kissing Katie. Get a free short story just for signing up for a free e-newsletter. Josephine's newsletter includes polls, showing off covers before they are published, sneak peeks, promotions, contests, upcoming releases, and more. Just go to https semicolon backslash backslash dl dot bookfunnel dot com backslash q i r l nine n g n one zero. Jackson Davis is in a panic. Seven years ago, he sent a manuscript to an editor as a joke. Now he's becoming a famous romance writer under the pen name J. D. Emerson, and his editor wants him to go on a tour, including an interview on a daytime's talk show. The problem? He let everyone think he's a woman writer. Katie Sutton is just not making it in life. Her car is an oil-gulping rust bucket. Her hours are being reduced at the daycare center where she works. Plus, her rent has gone up. She's always had a crush on Jackson, her friend Trent's older brother, but he sees her as he always has, Trent's buddy. Katie might just be the perfect answer to his problems if Jackson can get her to accept a position to pose as his pen name and do the tour for him. She could be the face of his muse. From mishaps to writer's block and stage fright, Jackson and Katie are spending a lot of time together. For the first time, Jackson is really looking at Katie. What he sees makes him think of taking the romance off the paper and into reality. Kissing Katie, find it on Amazon. And happy reading. <laughs>